Coming up next on Newswatch at Noon, find out why Athens has a chance to make history during May's upcoming primary election. Have you ever left a tip at Casa Nueva restaurant? Did you know the workers there don't accept tips? Find out what the employees do with your extra change. And in sports, Ohio University's softball team had a huge win last night against Marshall University. We have all the highlights. Newswatch at Noon starts now. In 10 days, Athens City residents will decide if the city will be the first in the country to have a local carbon tax. Good afternoon, I'm Katherine Mori. And I'm Connor Keurig. Carbon emissions in Athens caused more than a million dollars in damage last year. And the issue on the ballot will decrease that number, but it too comes with a price. Our News Watch at Noon reporter Elise Hammond is live in the newsroom. Elise, why should voters pay attention to issue three? Voters actually have a chance to make history. Issue 3, most commonly known as the carbon fee, would be the first program of its kind in the country. At a town hall meeting hosted by the Athens League of Women's Voters last night, Mayor Steve Patterson said the carbon fee is all about leading the nation. One dollar and sixty cents. That's about what the carbon fee would cost Athens residents each month. My cup of coffee is costing more on a single day than this would cost per month. The program introduced by the Southeast Ohio Public Energy Council would create a fund that would add solar panels to public buildings. Mayor Steve Patterson says by saving on the city's utility bill, more money would be available for other projects such as a full renovation of Arts West. It allows the city to start thinking about what we can do with that otherwise budget electric bill and utilizing that money in other ways. If the issue passes, residents would have an option of opting out of the program. City Council President Chris Nisley says the program follows Athens' commitment to sustainability. We were also the first community in the state of Ohio to have curbside research. And the city of Athens has a few goals that they think solar panels like these will help them achieve. A couple of those goals include a 20% decrease in residential energy, a 20% increase of energy coming from renewable sources, and most importantly, a 20% increase in solar capacity in the city. And the idea of a historic step for Athens has community members like Joan Krenansky excited. And Athens will become maybe a really interesting hub for people to come and investigate and we can offer them examples of how to go about doing this for all the community. Kranansky says she thinks the issue will pass but stresses the importance of getting people to the polls. That's really important that we get everybody out to vote or as many people as possible regardless of their party affiliation. The city is considering Arts West, the City Garage, and the Athens Community Center as likely locations for some of the first solar panels. And anyone who wants to vote on the carbon fee can ask for an issue ballot regardless of political party affiliation. Uh, overall, the program is expected to generate eighty to $90,000 each year. Reporting at noon, I'm Elise Hammond. Thanks, Elise. If you have more questions about the carbon tax ballot issue, head over to woub.org to learn more. Two Athens businessmen would like to be appointed interim Athens County Treasurer. Pete Kotsis is currently on City Council and co-owner of the Athens Bicycle Shop. Rick Wasserman serves on the County Planning Commission and owns the Pigskin and the Corner on Union Restaurant. Both men have said if selected for the interim position, they would run for the Treasurer's office in November. Democrat Treasurer Bill Bias stepped down from the office last week for personal reasons. A new sewage treatment plant will be coming to Southeast Ohio. Nelsonville City Council approved a sewage treatment agreement yesterday under an emergency ordinance. The urgency is so Murray City and Carbon Hill can begin construction plans to tie into Nelsonville's current sewer plant. The communities of Candytown, Longstreth, and other parts of Howkin County will be served by the project. Nelsonville residents may see a 5% increase in sewer bills to cover the cost. A new water park owned by Hawking College is set to open Memorial Day weekend. Hawking College recently spent around $100,000 on water inflatables at Lake Snowden. The park will feature these inflatables in addition to a swimming area and campground. Daily tickets as well as weekend and seasonal passes will be available for purchase. 
The Athens Fire Department took to the water, but not for play. Firefighters are conducting their annual water rescue training in the Hawking River. The training is split up into three days. Fire wor firefighters work on rope training, dealing with flip boats, and then conduct mock rescues of victims. Firefighters said it's a good time for the training because the Hawking River is running high and fast from all of the water we've had. I think the training is going very well. Like I said, we have uh, several new guys, so their enthusiasm, you know, helps keep things up and moving. Today is the last day of the water rescue training. Jail is off the plate for a Nelsonville man. Instead, his attempted solicitation charges land him a seat in John School. John School is an educational program in Columbus for first-time offenders only that teaches the consequences of solicitation. Rex Engel was caught soliciting what he thought was an underage girl on the internet. It turned out that girl was a detective. The statewide Amber Alert for three Athens children was canceled overnight. Athens police say the children are safe and their father is in custody. Neil Perrin is accused of kidnapping his children and fleeing to Cleveland. Perrin did not have custody of the children. When people go to a restaurant, they usually expect to leave a tip for their server. But that's not the case at Casa Nueva on Court Street where servers don't accept tips. They do not accept tips from customers. Newswatch at Noon reporter Anna Hoffman is live at Casa to explain why there's a no tip rule and what happens when people still leave money on the table. Casa Nueva stopped accepting tips in 2012 because they want to charge their customers what they believe their food and labor are worth. Despite the rule, many customers still leave tips. That is when Casa Nueva decided to donate that extra money to local charities. Casa Nueva has never quite liked the tipping system. The owners of Casa say they believe that all workers, whether working directly with the public or in the back, should be paid equally. We changed to a system that was really similar to the old system. Um, it used to be that if someone left a tip, we would keep all of the tips until the end of the pay period and they were divided based on how many hours that we worked. And so that was a really fair way of doing things. CASA continued this system for a few years, but separating those tips each week became a headache. That's when the restaurant decided to put those tips to better use and become a no-tipping establishment. Although it has been a few years, many of Casa Nueva's customers do not know that they do not accept tips. Therefore, they'll still leave tips for their waiters at the bar and at the tables. Because this always happens, Casa Nueva decided that they would donate the tips they received to charity. The policy soon grew into a program that people enjoy contributing to. Each month, Casa chooses a different organization to donate to. Each organization selected to receive these donations are invited to host one happy hour event to promote their cause. Aiden's Dream, a local nonprofit that helps families living with spinal muscular atrophy, was picked by Casa to receive these donations in February. This was the second time this nonprofit was chosen, and CASA donated close to $1,500 to this small nonprofit each time. Every dollar that we receive uh, as a donation is uh, valued greatly. From a nonprofit standpoint, um, it, it's a, a great program. Um, from a community member standpoint, there's, there's a lot of things they could do with that money. Booker says that spreading the money around to different nonprofits each month makes the community stronger. Casa believes that this no tipping trend is not only creating a positive environment within their restaurant, but also within the community. Reporting live for Newswatch at noon, I'm Anna Hoffman. Thank you, Anna. Forty years later, we remember the tragedy that took place at Willow Island, West Virginia. On April 27, 1978, men were constructing the second cooling tower at Pleasant's power plant. This History Channel recreation shows when the newly built concrete wall gave way. 51 people died during this tragic incident. 16 of the 51 killed were residents of Pleasant County and two lived in the neighboring Newport. The, this incident falls into the list of one of the deadliest construction accidents in the U.S. Tomorrow, a memorial is planned in remembrance of the Willow Island disaster. President Trump's VA nominee is denying accusations of being a heavy drinker. So, why did he withdraw his name? And after 40 years, a suspect has finally been arrested in the Golden State serial killer case. That and more when Newswatch at Noon returns.
145 over 92. 180 over 111. 182 over 100. And I had a heart attack and a cardiac arrest and then a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a heart attack or stroke are far from invisible or silent. My memory is shot. When I woke up, I couldn't speak. I can't button up a shirt. I can't run. I've had to learn to swallow again. That's the only more minutes that I have. And I'm 33, so I never see this coming. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. Had I done this, had I done that, hell, I messed up. Get back on your plan or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhpp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. I had to tell. I'm Peter, and there's nothing I love more than sharing vegetables with my friends. Come on in! Help yourself to anything! That's why we give our food the utmost respect it deserves. Did you know, there are simple steps we can all take to help save food. You can cook it, store it, even share it. Just don't waste it. Because when it comes to food, better ate than never. To learn more, visit savethefood.com. A 40-year-old cold case just got piping hot. After four decades of investigation, authorities in California arrested the so-called Golden State Killer. 72-year-old Joseph James D'Angelo was arrested outside of his Sacramento home yesterday. Authorities say he's responsible for 12 murders and at least 50 rapes across California between 1976 and 1986. This filing is just the beginning of the prosecution of Mr. D'Angelo, it is the culmination of a decades-long, unrelenting investigation that's singularly focused on bringing this rapist and killer to justice. D'Angelo is facing murder charges and other counts related to the 1980 killings. Rear Admiral Ronnie Jackson has withdrawn his nomination to lead the Department of Veteran Affairs. White House whistleblowers accuse Jackson of improperly dispensing drugs and being intoxicated on the job. Jackson is also accused of handing out prescription drugs and being intoxicated on multiple on-duty overseas trips. Jackson is denying all allegations against him. You never wrecked the car. Did anything happen with opioids? The, no, the no. Democrats are laying no. all this out. I have no idea where that's coming from. Do you still want to move forward? No, I have not wrecked the car, so I can do that. Will you that's move easy forward, to, sir? Will you Thanks, move guys. forward? We're still moving ahead. Thank you. We're still you. moving ahead. You did you Jackson has been the physician to three presidents over the past 12 years. Protests against EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt broke out this morning outside the White House. Pruitt has two hearings today. One was before the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee this morning, and another one this afternoon before the Interior and Environment Subcommittee. Pruitt will face allegations about his ethics and management decisions. We're evaluating these concerns, and we expect the EPA administrator to answer for them, and we'll keep you posted. The White House Counsel's Office will also examine allegations of Pruitt's installation of a soundproof phone booth purchase of first-class flight tickets, as well as large pay raises given to two staff members who moved with him to D.C. The travel ban, one of the most controversial moves of the Trump administration, was debated in Supreme Court yesterday. The latest version limits immigrants from several Muslim-majority countries, as well as North Korea and Venezuela. The government argued President Trump's ban is crucial to national security, while opponents said it represents executive overreach and lacks justification that un unconstitutionally bans Muslims based on their religion. 
Returning to campus after summer break is a worry for many international students at Ohio University. The university housed 18 students last year who feared not being able to return to campus because of the travel ban. That opportunity will not be available this year, according to the Vice President of Student Affairs, Jason Pina. Pina says Student Affairs spent around $50,000 to support these students and were not able to raise that much money again. Mohammed Amira, <coughs> President of the Muslim Student Association, says the university should focus their efforts on supporting students lot of creative students who do a lot of amazing projects so these students should be number one priority of the university and the students should feel about that Student Affairs says it's helping students impacted by this change by helping them apply for campus jobs and find other campus living options is spring finally here to stay? We have the answer in the seven-day forecast. And the Ohio softball team has been on a roll. Find out if they stayed on that roll when Newswatch at Noon returns. Hello. Hi. I'm from Blue Hood Stone Barns. We brought a meal for you and I'm here to serve it to you. Okay, great. Come in. Zucchini carbonara, made from zucchini that was harvested earlier this morning. Again? Oh. <laughs> hey, Dan Barber. You have room for a little bit more? <laughs> come yeah, on come in. Come on in. Brochettes, the sausage. So when we made that zucchini carbonara, you know, they're the end pieces of the zucchini, and they're the cores that we cut away, not to mention zucchini flour. Usually those get thrown out. We use them to create an entire second dish. Does that help? Oh. Again? Uh, I'm here to bring you your third course. It's the vines from your zucchini. We'll have a little zucchini stem pasta. A different experience of zucchini. When we start to think differently about our food, we can get a lot more out of it. This is delicious. What do you think we can make out of this? 40% of food in America is never eaten. Cook it, store it, share it. Visit savethefood.com. Take a look under your bed. Find stuff under there. What about jobs? No? Now try your closet. Still no jobs? Just more stuff? Well, you really have both. See, stuff is defined as household articles considered as a group. Sometimes this stuff is no longer needed. Wait, no longer needed? I can't be right. Because remember those jobs you were looking for? Those are really needed. And they're the stuff inside your stuff. Our job is to unlock those jobs. And it starts when you donate your stuff to your local Goodwill. Here's how we do it. When you donate to Goodwill, we sell your stuff to provide job training for people right here in your community. So just by teaming up with Goodwill, you help create jobs. And isn't that worth parting with the leftover guitar from your 80s cover band? Goodwill. Donate stuff, create jobs. Now, walking around outside today, it looked to me like a classic spring day. Yes, the kids can finally wait for the school bus without those winter jackets. I know, it must be nice. We have uh, weather anchor Mary Puzder who is going to give us a full forecast. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Connor. Today is a perfect day for spring. Got a classic summer, not quite summer yet, but we're getting excited for summer because it's partly cloudy today, not fully sunny, but we're easing into some clouds. So I know April showers are supposed to bring May flowers, but today we're not gonna get any rain, so the April showers are, are finally stopping. We're gonna get a little break from that. So today, 56 and partly cloudy. Looking at our right now regional map, as you can see down in Ironton, it's 61. Ripley, 63, that is our hotspot for today. Here in Athens, like I said, 56. If we go further up north here in Newark and Columbus, 55, 53, a little chillier than how we have here in Athens, but still pretty nice. Uh, we have for our Alamac today a high of 65, which is pretty on par with the normal temperature of 68. Nothing crazy like we have experienced earlier this month. We're definitely not hitting 90. Summer is far away. We are still dealing with our spring weather here in Athens. Our low of 48 is definitely better than the low of 27 that was in 1983. So happy for that. We're still pretty close to our normal temperature. Coming up for our afternoon highs, we will 
But before we get to our afternoon highs, we have this nice high pressure system coming in over here. We have here in Ohio right now. Uh, high pressure systems mean happier weather, so we don't have any low pressure systems to deal with. We're going to have low precipitation, not any at all, but we do have this cold front coming in eventually, which is why our temperatures are going to cool down as we go into the weekend. Coming up for our afternoon high. For our afternoon highs. We are going to be experiencing a little warmer weather than what we have right now. Eventually, in Athens, we'll get to 65 degrees. Up in Newark, be 64, a little cooler. Ironton, be your hot spot at 68. Coming up for our evening lows, it'll be definitely cooler. We're at that part of the season where it gets 20 degrees below what we are experiencing for our highest. So 48 in Athens, a little bit chilly. You're going to want that jacket. Down in Ironton, be 49 degrees. Up in Newark, be 46. Partly cloudy all evening, if not full coverage, depending on what area of the region you are at. Up, up for our hour by hour would be 60, 8 o'clock, mostly cloudy, and then clouds for the rest of the evening. Coming into our seven-day forecast, we will see as we go on through the weekend, it's definitely going to cool down. We're going to be in our 50s. 53 on Saturday, 56 on Sunday. And as we enter the next week, we're gonna have some lovely spring weather, definitely a bit warmer. We might even hit 79 degrees. Yeah, well, thanks, Mary. It's nice to have some good news for once. And if you're interested in local live music, head on over to Casa Cantina for a free early show with Knox. Find out those details and more in today's community calendar. The crowd went wild right at the buzzer at last night's Cavs game. Yeah, Connor, but that's NBA. Let's talk about Ohio. I hear the Ohio softball team had a great game last night, and we are joined by Joe Hennessy, who's going to tell us more. Yeah, the softball team has come back from their loss from Miami this past weekend. Yesterday, the Bobcats clawed their way to defeat Marshall. Newswatch at Noon reporter Maddie Young was there for the win and has the recap. <laughs> Bobcats welcome rivals Marshall yesterday. Marshall would get on the board first, starting off slow with the leadoff walk, the side end with two stolen bases, leading to a sacrifice pop-up. Bottom of the first, Ohio claws their way back. Alex Day started the inning hot, smacking a single to the left. She ended up scoring the first point of the inning. Michaela Dorsey up to bat, hits a fielder's choice, where Morgan Gino would be safe at third. Gino would later score on an RBI. Two outs in, Allie Inglant would crush an RBI double, clearing the bases. Bobcats take a 5-1 lead. Fast forward to the bottom of the fourth, Ohio's bats were hot. Ohio loads the bases when Natalie Alvarez crushes a two RBI single to center, scoring Cooper and Day, giving Ohio a 7-1 lead after four innings. The Bobcats would wrap up the game in the bottom of the sixth, Dorsey slamming a double center field to clear the bases, giving Ohio the 10-2 victory. <laughs> Natalie Alvarez, usually a catcher for the Bobcats, was put in as first base for the first time. Just adaptability is one of our strengths as a team, and we just did that very well today with Katie being gone. Head coach Jody Hermanak says she is happy about the win, but the team still has things to work on. To be honest, I'm super happy about the win, but I don't think it was our best day um, as far as our mentality and our intention to come out here and, and really be strong on a win. After the win, the Bobcats are 29-14 and 14 before they head to Buffalo for the weekend. Reporting for Newswatch at noon, I'm Maddie Young. For the fourth straight week, a Bobcat pitcher was named the Mac East P Pitcher of the Week. Find out who when you check out WUB.org. And Ohio baseball is also finding success on the field. Redshirt senior designated hitter Michael Klein has been named the Mac Scholar Athlete of the Week. A big reason for the nomination was because of his two-out, two-RBI double in the top of the 12th inning against Kent State to take the lead. 
and he hit a grand slam against longtime Ohio rival Marshall. Over the last five games, he finished with a 579 slugging percentage, a team high eight runs, and ranked third on the team with five hits. Baseball in the Athens area is going well for every team, it seems like. The Athens Bulldogs are balling out in the TVC Ohio. They are on an 11 game win streak, currently sitting at 11 and 2, and they have won 20 straight league games dating back to last season. The Bulldogs are hungry and dominating the competition so far. Up next for Athens, they will play at Wellston tomorrow night, then at Chillicothe Saturday morning. And the Cavs are staying alive. The Cavs won a thriller in Game 5 last night at home. They're now only one game away from advancing to the next round of the NBA playoffs. And the matchup was fairly close all night. The Cavs bench was not up to par with the Pacers, so LeBron said, okay, it's time to take over. And that's exactly what he did, hitting a buzzer-beating three to win the game. It kind of reminds you of the Orlando Magic playoff game buzzer beater back in 2009. It's like spot on. It's right there. The Cavs now lead the Pacers by one game in the series 3-2. Game 6 will be played tomorrow night in Indianapolis. Staying in the Cleveland area, the Indians beat the Chicago Cubs yesterday at Progressive Field. Trevor Bauer took the mound for the Indians, pitching into the seventh inning and allowing only one run. That, that ended up being Chicago's only run of the night as the Indians' bullpen put up a great fight. Cleveland's bats were hot as well. With three runs against Chicago's ace John Lester and one more later on in the game, the final score favored Cleveland 4-1. to one. The Indians will stay at home tonight to face off against the 13-10 Seattle Mariners. On to Cincy and the Reds' battle against the Atlanta Braves today at 12.35 just after our show. The 5-19 Reds are looking to turn their season around and light that spark that could hopefully ignite a couple more wins. Homer Bailey will be on the mound for Cincinnati. He has an 0-3 record with a 3.68 ERA. And for the Braves, it will be left-hander Sean Newcomb. Scooter Gennett has been the offense of the Reds, leading the way with 22 hits on the year. He is followed by Jose Peraza and Joey Votto, and Adam Duvall leads the team in home runs with three. The Reds lost to the Braves yesterday by just one run in the ninth. They'll be looking for redemption today. All right, everybody listen up. As the great Michael Scott from The Office said, it's happening. The NFL draft starts tonight at 8, and it is going to be mayhem. The Browns hold the first pick, followed by the Giants, the Jets, the Browns again, and then the Broncos. And you're hearing live from Joe Hennessy right now on who will be going number one overall to the Cleveland, to Cleveland, and that is... I have no clue. Your guess is as good as mine. The Browns are 4-44 in the last three seasons and are looking for that player to turn it around. They thought it was Trent Richardson or Brandon Whedon or Corey Coleman or Johnny Manziel. And to be honest, not many people have a clue what the Browns will do, and I'm not sure the Browns organization knows what they're going to do. Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, Saquon Barkley, Josh Allen, Josh Rosen, the list goes on. Boom or bust, hot or not, franchise player, or bad pick. Browns, the choice is yours. Don't blow it. All right, that's all from me here at Sports. I'm going to send it back over to Catherine. Thanks, Joe. Thanks so much for those updates. And that's it for News at Noon today. Don't forget to tune into Newswatch tonight at 6.30. This will be our last show this spring, and we would like to thank you so much for joining us. Here's a look at the team that brought you Newswatch at Noon these last 10 weeks. Credits, for sure. <laughs>